Okay, uh, so let us uh, start. Uh, good. Welcome to today's set colloquium, uh, which is titled as Vikram Sarabhai, a life. This is by Amrita Shah, uh, who is a writer, journalist, and an independent scholar. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Alak, our colleague Alak Ray for proposing this talk. I hope you will join on the call very soon. Uh, I'll just say a couple of minutes, a uh, couple of uh, words about today's speaker. Amrita Shah is an author of an award-winning Ahmedabad, a city in the world, uh, which was published in 2015. And also this particular work, Vikram Sarabhai Life, uh, which uh, based on which the colloquium is going to be placed today. And also Tele uh, Guillotine, How Television Changed India, that is in 2019. She has actually worked for a number of uh, organizations, including uh, for the Time Life News Service, has been a contributing editor with the Indian Express newspaper for some time, and also launch editor for L India and editor Debonair magazine. She has been awarded a Fulbright Fellowship, a New India Foundation Fellowship, and also Homi Baba Fellowship, and has been a fellow at the Institutes for Advanced Studies in Nantes and also John Burke and the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. So with these few words about today's speaker, I now invite Amrita for his color. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Satyanaran. Uh, and it's really a great pleasure for me to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about Vikram Sarabhai, one of uh, the most fascinating um, individuals who I have had the great privilege of getting to know as a biographer very closely. Um, but when your invitation came, you know, I, I felt um, I, I was thrown in a bit of a quandary about what, how I should structure my talk. Um, it's been 15 years since I, uh, I wrote my biography, which is uh, to date the only, uh, the only uh, full-fledged biography uh, on Vikram Sarabhai. And uh, so much has changed in the 15 years since the book came out. The book came out in 2007. And you know, since then, the space program has uh, become, um, become so much a kind of, uh, you know, has enjoyed so much prominence and been so much a part of the news. We also had the Vikram Sarabhai centenary year. We've had you know, uh, new expeditions. And so there's been so much excitement around the space program over the last decade that I think that uh, uh, the context in which I wrote my book has changed dramatically. And so um, I was kind of wondering how should I talk, uh, talk about, uh, about uh, Professor Sarabhai. And um, one of the things I was thinking was, okay, should I just talk about the space program? And you will see why when I kind of begin to talk, why it's a little hard to structure a talk uh, on, on, um, on Professor Sarabhai. Um, but, um, you know, I thought, should I talk about the space program? Only talk about the space program. And the thing is, you know, I, over the last um, five years, I, there's like not a kind of, you know, every few weeks I'm invited to talk either on podcasts or on a documentary or I'm interviewed for radio or for, uh, you know, television, something or the other constantly. So I thought, you know, quite a, little, quite a bit now is known about the history of the space program. And maybe I should take the opportunity to do something else. Um, maybe go kind of somewhere else with this talk because we are talking about an individual who is an extremely unusual person. And I think of great relevance uh, in today's world. And so uh, indulge me, please. If I go on a bit of a ramble, um, you know, go uh, on a bit of a kind of journey, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe share the journey that I was taken on while um, exploring uh, Vikram Sarabhai's life. And so let me kind of go back uh, to the early 2000s when, um, when I actually started researching the book. And you know, at that time, the space program was not so much in the news. Of course, it was, you know, proud uh, kind of technological uh, program and uh, there was a great deal of pride and uh, it was known and, you know, inspired a lot of people, but it was not uh, upfront and in the news every day as, you know, one seems to kind of find it now. 
Uh, Vikram Sarabhai, the name uh, was known, of course, but again, I found that for a generation that was, you know, came of age probably after his death um, in 1971, there was a certain sort of forgetting. Um, and it happens, I find, as, as a writer, uh, particularly dealing with subjects in modern India, that uh, there seems to be, and this is just speculation, a kind of little time lag uh, by which time people start writing about uh, a certain period in history or certain individuals. Um, so 15 years ago, as I said, you know, I, I found that the way Sarabhai was described, institution builder, visionary, a founder of the space program, of course, didn't exactly convey, um, it didn't convey anything very specific. And I, I'll come to later why I was looking for a biography to read, because I was always fascinated from a very early age uh, by uh, Vikram Sarabhai. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but what I actually did was in the year 2000, I started looking for a biography to read and I couldn't find one. And I was then told that there wasn't a full-fledged biography. Uh, that really astonished me. But as I said, maybe there is something like a time lag, uh, you know, by which time people start actually kind of um, have that perspective to write uh, about a person. Um, there was, I think, little, little pieces of information. There was a booklet um, in Gujarati that someone sent me, but there was no full-fledged biography. And I kind of started looking then in, um, at books on modern India. And I started kind of um, looking at the indexes to find his name. And again, I couldn't find it anywhere. So it really, really astonished me. And I think what I wanted to do and what I'm trying, I think, uh, what I want to share with you today is a bit of what I saw as an aura around um, Vikram Sarabhai. I mean, he was a person with a sort of aura. There was a, you can call it glamour, you can call it a sort of uh, an aura of inspiration or what. There was some sort of magic uh, about him. And that's what I kind of wanted to, um, you know, I want to kind of go into a bit today, which is not strictly on the space program, but takes a much sort of wider view of his impact uh, at this particular time. I think it's extremely relevant to revisit this. So um, let me go back to, I was nine years old when Vikram Sarabhai died. And I have a very clear memory of the newspaper coming home uh, that morning. It was the 31st of December, 1971. And, uh, you know, it was the Times of India, which is what most of us read in those days. And um, the news was splashed across the front page, um, the news of Vikram Sarabhai's death. And um, I remember my mother kind of picking up the newspaper and, you know, sort of giving up the sort of gasp. Uh, and I said, oh, so I said, like, her reaction was so kind of, um, you know, was so uh, extreme that I sort of said, oh, what happened? And, and she said, oh, a great scientist died. And she said it as if she was so moved. And I was surprised because, you know, I have not, um, I never heard my mother take an interest in science or um, talk about scientists ever before. And I was kind of curious. Um, I was very young, but you know, it was at an age where I was just starting to do experiments in school and trying to kind of take an interest in science. And so this was a curious reversal as so I sort of, um, an interest you know I, I talked to my mother about it and uh, she started telling me things the things that she knew about Vikram Sarabhai and um, so I need to just oh. I'm sorry I need to figure out how to share the uh, how to go down Scrolling, right? Slides. Yeah. Huh, yeah. Sorry, this is just a photograph of, um, yes. So what my mother told me was that this, um, that the Sarabhais were a very illustrious uh, family. And um, I just want to kind of take the opportunity then to kind of share some photographs uh, that take you to, okay. So this is Vikram Sarabhai as a child, as a baby. Um, he was born on uh, August 12, 1919 in Ahmedabad, which is an old manufacturing and mercantile city. His forefathers were traders, bankers, and owners of textile mills. In fact, at the time of his birth, the Sarabhai were among the wealthiest business houses in the country. They were owners of uh, Calico Mills, which you know people of a certain generation would recognize as a very important brand name. Uh, I don't know if one could compare it to perhaps the sort of reliance of its time. 
Uh, by religion, uh, they were Jains. This is a photograph of Ambalal Sarabhai, who was Vikram's father. His own uh, history, sort of his own biography is, uh, is quite interesting. He was uh, often very young and had to take responsibility at a very early age, which gave him a kind of, uh, you know, he inherited both great wealth and uh, responsibility at a very early age, which made him unusually introspective. So it's a very unusual personality that you could say that the patriarch of the family had. Um, Ambalal held a position of uh, leadership within the Jain community, but uh, he was not afraid to kind of, I think that he was not, uh, he was not religious as much as, he, not dogmatic, uh, rather, you know, he was more sort of, his in interest in religion was more sort of philosophical. And uh, he was not afraid uh, to kind of, you know, um, to take, uh, take a stand or take decisions that would offend the community. So for instance, there was, a, there was an instance when uh, he had some rabid dogs in the Calico compound and he ordered them to be shot, which, uh, you know, caused a furor within the community, the Jain community where it was believed that taking a, you know, of any life uh, was a sin. But uh, Balal eventually then, you know, because of these various sort of um, differences actually left his position of leadership and, you know, rather than um, adhere to, to uh, kind of the values that uh, he thought um, were um, not important or rather needed to be kind of, you know, amended when he required. Um, as I said, you know, this was an extremely wealthy family, but they were also extremely cultured and the kind of guests here you see, uh, this is uh, Ambalal Sarabhai and um, his wife Sarla, both sitting on either side of Rabindranath Tagore and the children are, you see some of the children, there were eight children, Vikram was one of eight children. And um, Rabindranath Tagore was, you know, one of the many uh, influential people who passed through the house. Uh, the Sarabhais played host to people, you know, all the luminaries of the time, whether they were uh, political luminaries or um, cultural or from the field of art or science. So the names uh, that are, you know, some of the names are J.C. Bose, Jadunath Sarkar, Dr. S. Radha Krishnan, Sarojini Naidu, Motilal and Jawaharlal Nehru. All of them passed through um, Ahmedabad uh, and stayed with the Sarabhais. Uh, and in fact, um, the next slide is a letter that Rabindranath Tagore wrote um, to introduce Vikram Sarabhai to Cambridge. So you can kind of see the, the, the kind of uh, background that he came from. The Sarabhais were also, both Ambalal and his wife Sarla, were very interested in kind of fashioning what, what they called an ideal life. You know, they wanted to experiment. And with eight children, education was, of course, very much a, a concern. And they kind of read about a, a new system of education started by the educationist called Maria Montessori, who, um, you know, amongst many things, she had a very different way of teaching. She kind of um, she talked about the education of the senses. Uh, she also talked about inculcating a desire, um, as you see in this slide, a natural desire in, in, in the child to learn. The Sarabhai started a school on their, uh, on their uh, property which was about some 19 acres or 1920 acres. It was called a retreat. It was a beautiful, um, beautiful place with, uh, you know, sort of scattered with um, statues, with exotic plants, um, animals, uh, peacocks. Um, it was, I guess you could see some sort of, you know, paradise as people have compared it to. And the children were encouraged there. It was taken very seriously. This was not some uh, kind of maverick project. It was, there were teachers brought down from, uh, you know, both locally and uh, brought from England, uh, from Shanti Niketan, uh, and each sort of, since the pupil was encouraged to follow his or uh, her inclination, it was, you know, you had languages, history, sports, dance, music, whatever uh, a child seemed to show an inclination towards was encouraged. Uh, Vikram, for instance, at a very early age showed an inclination towards the mechanical. And so then his parents built a workshop for him where he could kind of play around with lathes and, you know, fiddle around with uh, mechanical objects and things like that. Um, now, one would think that this was, you know, this sort of wonderfully luxurious and uh, self-indulgent life, uh, extremely sensual, uh, extremely intellectual but, and cerebral. 
but it was not without its anxieties, uh, apart from, of course, usual life anxieties of illness and death and so on. Uh, the freedom movement was then at its height and the Sarabais were extremely involved. Uh, the family was very close to Gandhi, who was, of course, in Ahmedabad uh, at that time. Um, and the story goes that in 1915, when Gandhi uh, returned, when he returned from South Africa to India, and he decided to settle in Ahmedabad. He was uh, given uh, a place by a local, um, another industrialist. But when he decided to invite a couple from a lower caste to share, uh, you know, to live on the premises, uh, his, uh, his patron was offended and uh, withdrew his support. And at that time, there was an anonymous donor who came and dropped off, um, you know, sufficient money, sufficient funds for him to kind of uh, start uh, to relocate and start all over again. And uh, this person, uh, who was at that point not named, was Ambalal Sarabhai. So he he had a great, um, great kind of I don't know if you can call it friendship, but just definitely a great closeness. Uh, so did his wife, and so did the entire family. They all participated in the freedom movement, uh, in the sense, particularly the women. Uh, Ambalal's um, eldest daughter, Midula, was jailed. Uh, so here is a picture of her. Uh, and they were frequently, they were in and out of jail during the Quit India movement. So uh, including, you know, and it was quite a frightening time for the Sarabai children, Vikram and his siblings, because periodically, um, you know, either a car would be taken off uh, as, as a sort of, um, some sort of, um, you know, payment or um, someone would be going off to jail constantly. So as you can see, it was a very unconventional family, affluent, aware, socially conscious, and willing to throw themselves into the fray for their beliefs. And you see all these aspects uh, in, uh, you know, in Vikram Sarabhai's career. And at various points, uh, you know, the way he reacts, etc. you can see the kind of uh, the impact of the family background in, in, his, uh, in his personality and actions. Um, so to return to this conversation I was having as a nine-year-old with my mother, um, my mother told me that Vikram Sarabhai was married to Brinalini Swaminathan, who was, of course, who herself came from a very distinguished family. Uh, and uh, um, uh, in fact, um, when they married, one of my, someone, I, uh, an elderly lady I know who used to live in Bangalore told me that as school children, they used to watch um, Vikram and Renalini, uh, you know, go out driving. So clearly they were a very glamorous couple. Uh, Renalini was from the South, um, Vikram Sarabhai was from the West. Um, so there was that kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of progressive uh, idea about their marriage. Unusually, uh, Renalini was a working woman, a performer, and this was a style of one of the uh, wealthiest families in the country, if not uh, one of the wealthiest families in the world. And the two, um, Vikram Sarabhai and Rinalini Sarabhai, co-founded a dance institution called Darpana. So while I was listening to all this, I kind of kind of understood why someone like my mother, who was not a scientist and not interested in science, could be, become sort of, um, become so moved by Vikram Sarabhai's death, because his life, in a sense, uh, represented something, uh, which I will come to in a minute. Uh, we, we, you know, so we followed the news. We, we saw the tributes from well-known people that had come. Uh, Sarabha had passed away in his sleep in Kovalam, which was where the sounding rocket program uh, was in Tumba. And the body was transported to Ahmedabad, where crowds had turned up to pay their respects. And we read that uh, his son was abroad and could not make it back in time. So his uh, daughter, Malika, who was a young dancer, actress at the time, lit the funeral fire. So you can imagine that as a child, all this a mix of science, dance, cosmopolitanism, gender equality, and so on, it impressed me very deeply. And I had this sort of idea of Vikram Sarabhai as someone very progressive, someone very modern, someone kind of uh, who represented something quite different and unusual and very a personality that touched uh, people beyond uh, beyond the world of science. In the years to come, I came to know other things about Vikram Sarabhai. Uh, I came to know that he founded various institutions uh, like uh, Atira, um, which was the Ahmedabad uh, Textile Industries uh, Research Association for Industrial Research. And the photograph of the gentleman is Kasturbhai Lalbhai, who was a local philanthropist. And uh, 
Uh, Vikram Sarabhai and Arbai also worked together to set up the in Indian Institute of Management, the IIM in Ahmedabad. Uh, Vikram Sarabhai also co-founded the National Institute of Design um, with his siblings, uh, Gita and, uh, sorry, Gira and Gautam uh, Sarabhai. Um, and uh, he also managed some of the family companies, including Sarabhai Chemicals. And um, for some reason, this struck me as most interesting was that he also founded India's first market research agency, the Operations Research Group. Um, so I came to know also that Vikram Sarabhai had taken care, uh, taken charge of India's nuclear program uh, after Homi Baba's death in 19, um, 1966. And uh, this was in the fateful years leading up to the first uh, Pokhram blast in 1974. But I also understood, and this is quite a significant uh, aspect in my book, um, which is uh, Vikram Sarabhai's approach to the bomb, which uh, approach to the matter of nuclear weaponization, where he had a kind of more complex and unconventional approach, which was not kind of quite clearly understood. So that was something that I, I spent a bit of time researching and uh, trying to articulate. But my most, re my most intense engagement with Vikram Sarabhai was over television. Now, I mean, I know it's sort of, um, uh, it, this is not something that is widely, it's an interest that is, uh, you know, not widely known now. And I guess it was at a certain point where television was just coming into the country and there was much more talk about it. Um, but I, um, I was uh, interested in media history and so it was on the pages of, in fact, on, um, on books on the electronic uh, revolution uh, that I read about it from Sarabhai's name. And I actually saw a one page profile in one of these books, which must, I would say, probably sparked off the motivation to know more about him. And uh, my books were, were about the social, um, political and social cultural impact of the electronics revolution starting in the 1980s and going on to the 1990s. But if you look at media history, uh, this was a period where there was still a lot of, um, there was a still a kind of, um, not confusion exactly, but a kind of discussion on where India should be going, where India should be going in terms of, um, you know, hardware, the hardware revolution was, you already had uh, the spread and the proliferation of uh, television, but how to, or what to, what content and how to kind of, or should it still be a public, or should it be a monopoly, government monopoly, or should there be autonomy and then what should, what shape should the autonomy take, et cetera. And frequently you saw that on all discussions of software on content, uh, people harked back to what Vikram Sarabhai was saying. So here was sort of what I was thinking about today when I was trying to figure out how I should, what kind of talk should I give today? Uh, I was wondering, well, should I talk about uh, the unusual family, uh, you know, his his father, one of the wealthiest men men in the world, but unusually introspective and trying to fashion an ideal life, an ideal life in which, mind you, this is a picture of Ambalal's sister Ansuya uh, Sarabhai. Uh, if Ambalal Sarabhai was the owner of the biggest textile mills in Ahmedabad, then Ansuya Sarabhai, his sister, decided to form uh, to fight for the uh, rights of workers who worked in the textile mills. And she and Gandhi together, in fact, started uh, what was India's earliest uh, labor uh, labor union, which kind of became a model for uh, labor relations in the country. Uh, and so this this is this is a kind of significant point that this was a family in which differences were allowed, and in which uh, different points of view were kind of given an airing. And again, this is frequently you see it in Vikram Sarabhai's life where at various points where he kind of had disagreements with people or there were people who were trying to not, um, who were not in sync with him or trying to oppose him in a certain way. He was fairly patient with him, kept listening to him. Uh, in fact, to the kind of surprise of, of a lot of people. But so th these are all kind of, I, I guess, elements of, of his background that play out, played out or to play out in his career. So I was wondering, should I talk about this unusual family? Uh, I mean, dwell at length on it rather, or should I talk about Vikram Sarabhai's personal life, again, his, his marriage, his romantic life, his friendships and the choices he made? Um, should I talk about his institutions, the fact that they are still sort of thriving, uh, you know, half a century after he 
So here is, um, for instance, the Indian Institute of Management. There's so much you know, to say about each institution. Um, just, just for instance, the fact of how it started off, um, the, how the management structure was, was evolved to ensure a certain amount of autonomy, uh, how they kind of entered into collaborations with, uh, uh, with Harvard, for instance, and they tried to develop indigenous um, business histories, pretty much what he also did in the scientific institutions, but tried, tried to kind of uh, look abroad for some, some models and then you know, try and also reproduce, but also kind of innovate. Uh, in India. Note also the architecture, and this is a photograph of Louis Kahn. Um, and I thought it was important again to show the aesthetic component of Vikram Sarabhai's uh, thinking. Uh, he and Louis Kahn, in fact, um, spent a lot of time you know, across a dining table discussing ideas and what, what kind of, not just, it was not just purely uh, aesthetic or design, but also the very kind of um, principles, there was something that Vikram Sarabhai did always was go right to the kind of root of, um, root of something and try and understand uh, something in a rather kind of long and large sort of perspective. Uh, so that he was very, he was always, it seemed on firmer ground, uh, you know, he was, um, he, he was starting from the kind of foundation and laying a very strong foundation at the same time. So, uh, Khan and he discussed concepts of, you know, the kind of concept of what was below zero, what, what was the beginning of the beginning uh, in, in trying to evolve a design for IIM. So as I said, does one talk about that? Should I talk about his management style, uh, which was, Vikram Sarabhai believed in collaborations. I've already shown a photograph of Kasturbhai Lalbhai, uh, who was someone who was much older than him, a uh, local textile baron who he who he combined forces with to start many of his institutions. But Sarabhai used to seek out, I mean, I, I, I found when I interviewed people, they were almost like in tears when they would talk about him because he was very much a people's person. He gave trust very freely. He relied very freely on people, though he also guided and protected uh, his subordinates from you know, red tape or um, whenever they needed protection or whether, whenever they needed inspiration and so on. But there were other people like he, he was not, it seems like he was open to interaction. So here is a photograph of um, Homi Baba and uh, Nehru. Uh, Nehru, of course, because of the Sarabhai's connections, the, uh, Nehru was someone that Vikram Sarabhai had, had seen and met when he was young. Um, Indira Gandhi, again, his daughter was someone who was known to the family. Um, and Homi Baba and uh, Vikram Sarabhai had met when they were, had spent time together when they were at the Indian Institute of Science and had become friends. Uh, and uh, there was a, a great deal of respect. Um, and I, in fact, I even speculate in my book that there was some sort of, uh, almost some sort of um, synergy in the way they, they went ahead with, uh, you know, forming the twin programs of space and um, new, uh, atomic energy. And space was sort of started under the Department of Atomic Energy. So I kind of speculated that, you know, maybe these two, princes of Indian science, um, you know, sealed some sort of blood pact, uh, you know, in the kind of wilderness of uh, the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, Baba was uh, become sort of by senior by, by 10 years, but uh, they were very similar in, in, in a sense, you know, that they were kind of both from the West, uh, both sophisticated, both cultured, came from affluent families, and had a certain uh, ease, um, you know, very exposed to the West, uh, certainly culturally very aware. So it's not kind of surprising that they should have become friends. But uh, what is interesting is their kind of, um, is their joint endeavor um, to forge ahead, uh, you know, to start these sort of important institutions. And I, I think that some of what I'm saying, it seems almost commonsensical, but it is unusual to see partnerships being forged, or collaborations being made without, you know, uh, um, some sort of hierarchy coming in or some sort of other things intruding. And I think that one of the things that I found about Vikram Sarabhai was his great um, openness and willingness to, he used to talk about this concept of mutuality all the time, by which I assume he meant a certain reciprocity, which meant, you know, that he, uh, he could treat people with great respect and was open to, to taking as well as giving uh, with people. 
So as I said, I was kind of, you know, going through wondering how I should talk. Then again, there is a sort of question about um, uh, Vikram Sarabhai stand on nuclear weaponization and the fight he had to pick up, uh, put up for his, for his views, which were in a sense, uh, somewhat, I'd say more complex. I don't think that they were straightforward and I'm not, uh, I, I find that there's a sort of binary way of thinking about this issue. And his was not, uh, his, his was not, I, I think, so straightforward. Uh, but, um, but, you know, since I have this photograph of Baba right here, and then there was, there was uh, at not at the same time, but there was a kind of difference in the way each uh, approached the issue. Um, Sarah Baba just before his death in the mid sixties and Sarabhai soon after. Uh, so I was wondering if I should talk about that, but again, that is a very, long and complicated uh, sort of um, issue to go into uh, and not, if I only, I could only talk about that. So if you see, there was this sort of um, quandary about how to talk about a person who does so many things, who has, uh, who has as I said, um, ha has, takes you into so many different directions. And um, so while I was thinking about this, I kind of started thinking about, you know, just the fact, uh, not so much about space, because he's now, you know, talked about as the founder of the space program, but one of its applications and that, which is, you know, so much a part of our lives, which is, of course, communication. Um, this was as early as 1963 that Sarabhai started talking about, uh, you know, uh, his sort of desire to use, this is a, a more recent picture, but, um, started talking about, you know, he made public his desire to use satellites for communication. And it seemed an audacious idea because in 1962, uh, the Soviets had just about launched the world's first uh, early bird or synchronous uh, sat satellite. And even in 1964, when the International Telecommunications Satellite Consortium was formed in Washington, it seemed as if only rich nations would ever be able to maintain and use satellites. But Sarabhai believed quite passionately in the idea of using uh, communication technology for development. And, uh, you know, they, they, he and his colleagues were involved in several small scale experiments in community television, such as uh, what was called Krishi Darshan. Uh, and then all of which culminated in the monumental uh, satellite instruction television experiment. Uh, you see in a photograph here. The agreement, um, this was, a, this was a, an experimental satellite communications project launched uh, in jointly designed by NASA and the um, and uh, the Indian Space Research Organization, the agreement between the Department of Atomic Energy and NASA was signed in September 1969. But the actual experiment took place after Sarabhai's death. Um, site involved creating informative programming on issues of health, education, agriculture, and so on, and relaying the same to audiences in 2000 the 2,400 of the poorest villages in the country between August 1975 to 31st July 1976. So I was you know, thinking about this and the reality of what we have now, uh, you know, and the form it has taken. And I don't need to kind of say very much about the kind of proliferation of, uh, of electronic media that we have today, you know, whether it's cell phones, uh, television screens, the internet, uh, uh, it's just all around us. And media is very much the sort of uh, part of the atmosphere. And uh, this is something that, you know, Sarabhai saw uh, all those years ago. Uh, but I also was struck by the fact that he saw it in another form. This was not the form that he envisaged. And in a sense, technologically, we have perhaps sort of arrived at a place where, which he had thought of a long, long time ago. And so in a, more, in a way, he is so current right now because what he envisaged is actually kind of there around us um, and, and, and in a way that we can actually kind of appreciate uh, his vision. But he, there has been a sort of much of a departure away from how he envisaged it. And so I thought, you know, this was a good point maybe um, at which since we're talking so much about modern India and the building of a new India and uh, the thinking ahead, um, 
you know, in, in the 75th year of Indian independence, and it seems to be some sort of time of reckoning or stock taking, uh, where do we go from here? And I thought, given that this is a visionary figure who we are now kind of seeing as, I mean, he was always called a visionary, but now it seems as if we are actually seeing his vision um, in a way that is sort of upfront and uh, very, very prominent. As I thought maybe it was also a good idea, a good time to maybe revisit his uh, vision itself. And what did he actually intend uh, doing? And so I thought I would, um, Sarabhai was very good with words. He gave a lot of speeches. And so I thought maybe I would just let him, I've picked out a few quotes and I want him to, uh, you know, in his own words to sort of uh, speak with a few kind of, um, with a bit of direction from me. And so I'm kind of going to divide into two aspects, uh, his vision. Um, so I'm going to start with, you know, the form of science and technology. Uh, because whatever Sarabhai did, and regardless of the range of institutions that he founded, he was a scientist. His approach was scientific. And uh, everything he did, he was sort of, that, that was his framework uh, through which he approached the world, through which he saw everything, you know, whether it was art or culture, they were all aspects that he entered into as a scientist. And I think that that was something that I want to talk a little bit about um, to begin with, and then I will move to another part of his, of his vision. Um, so just to very briefly, I have not talking about Sarabhai the scientist in detail here. I mean, he got his PhD from Cambridge in the study of cosmic rays and tropical altitudes. Uh, that was the title of his PhD uh, study. Uh, his area of focus was determined at uh, the Indian Institute of Science, where, as I just mentioned, he spent some time during at a time in World War II interrupted his studies in Cambridge. There he was advised by C.V. Raman, who was head of physics uh, at the time. And it also happened that uh, Raman's friend, the American Nobel Prize winning physicist, Robert Millikan, was studying cosmic rays and conducting balloon experiments in uh, Bangalore, in fact, in 1940. Um, and uh, so Raman kind of directed, uh, suggested that he study um, tropical, uh, he studied cosmic rays at various uh, latitudes uh, and uh, various altitudes uh, and uh, to supplement uh, Millikan's research. But only the difference was that Vikram used Geiger counters. And uh, he went on to kind of uh, work on this field, uh, build on it. He was a working scientist till his death. And, you know, one of the, the stories his colleagues tell was that However busy he was, however much, you know, he had all these various multiple engagements. He was head of the atomic energy program. He was uh, head of space. He was, he had started this sort of string of institutions, uh, whatever, regardless of whatever his commitments, he would land up at the physical research laboratory, um, which was the laboratory founded in Ahmedabad and he would work late at night and they would hear the sound of his chuckles flapping and, you know, his whistling as he went up the stairs. So I'm not going to say more about his science here, but what I want to kind of say is that for him, science was much larger than the work itself. He had kind of imbibed the approach of science and made it you know, his, his way of, as I said, approaching uh, life. I mean, it was not a specific area of physics alone or a particular question alone that fascinated him. He was passionate about science itself, its premises, its attitudes, its rigor, its aims, and so I'm going to kind of again just bring up, sorry, this is a photograph, of course, with C.V. Raman. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a, a quote that um, many people suppose that there is the absence of the imaginative and intuitive element in the pursuit of science, in contrast to philosophy, literary or artistic endeavor. This surely is a fallacy. A person who has imbibed the ways of science injects into a situation a new way of looking at it, hopefully perhaps a degree of enlightenment with regard to the approach to problems and that provides leadership, which is very valuable. So one part of um, Vikram Sarabhai's goal was to, to, was to do with science and technology and his wish to grow, make India grow in its capability in this regard. One of his favorite phases was uh, leapfrogging 
It referred to his great faith along with Baba and Nehru in the ability of technology to enable the developing countries to short circuit the long arduous processes followed by the Western world. So here again, I want to bring up another Sarabhai quote. There are those who preach that developing nations must proceed step by step following the same process by which the advanced nations themselves progressed. One is often told that such and such a thing is too sophisticated to be applied. This approach disregards what should perhaps be obvious, that when a problem is great, one requires the most effective means available to deal with it. Vikram believed in applied science. Uh, this one can see in many ways. And this quote I have taken from a brochure brought out on the Silva anniversary of Atira, which is the research institution set up in Ahmedabad. Uh, it was part of a nationwide push to indigenize industrial processes. And Atira was set up by the textile industry and became a model that was emulated uh, by others. The history of science is full of examples which alternate from being extremely practical to being extremely basic in their approach. And it is through the interaction between the basic and the empirical and practical problems that we find the greatest and most fruitful de developments of modern science and technology. So the space program, of course, is a good example of, of, um, of a program with the great potential to stimulate growth in advanced fields such as electronics, or chemicals, cybernetics, and in materials engineering. But he saw other kinds of advantages as well. Um, he also saw advantages and the possibility of collaborative relationships with organizations, scientists, and technologists abroad, which would be the nucleus of a new culture where, um, again, where people in diverse activities learn to work together for the purpose of a single objective. Sarabhai believed in self-reliance and indigenization. Uh, there are times when you know, he was frustrated because the government decided to import some piece, some kind of technology entirely from somewhere denying Indians, uh, as he saw it, denying Indians a chance to innovate at home. But he was never, and I, I want to kind of stress on this, that he was never insecure about the outside world. I think that there's, to, to some degree, there's a kind of, um, um, it's very similar to Baba's approach as well. Um, they, you know, that they were, they were comfortable both with the international world and with India. And while they were very, Proud Indians wanting to indigenize and be self-reliant. Um, they were never insecure about the outside world. It was, uh, and in Sarabhai's case, certainly you kind of see him bringing in people to, you know, to collaborate or to se or sending his students to sort of uh, learn from other places. There was any, never, never that kind of insecurity. And he would often kind of talk about, you know, this is one of his favorite phrases, working with the thin edge of the wedge. So, you know, uh, work away and wherever you could find an advantage, find it uh, to sort of to, to sort of acquire know-how uh, and, and become self-reliant by learning from wherever one needed to. Um, but of course, you know, here too, he had, for instance, some thoughts. And so he, he did sort of stress on, he, 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 there was another phrase of his, which, which I couldn't quite find the quote itself, but he says, you know, if you can find, well, if there was a kind of lesson to be learned from the East, uh, then he would, you know, say let's learn from the East if we can, if there's an opportunity rather than from the West, just to, I guess, to balance out the privileges uh, of an unequal world. And then in the context of brain drain, again, I want to quote another, um, this is what he said. We know that conditions of work in India within our own specialized scientific fields rarely match the facilities available in several other countries. Some get frustrated striving against heavy odds Others leave the country. But those that can apply their insights to the problems of the community and of the nation discover an exciting area of activity where effort is rewarding, even while the results show slowly. Now, this phrase, problems of the community and of the nation, is important. And I want to now come to the kind of second part um, of, his, of, his, uh, of his vision. And it was to me, uh, to my mind, from what I've seen of his work, uh, the driving force of everything that he pursued. Now let us, I mean, if you look at the space program, uh, you know, if you look at the time um, in the 50s and the 60s, where you start kind of moving in that direction, uh, the impulse for the evolution of rocket technology in the West and in the world at that time was primarily defense related 
was linked, even the science that was done uh, was linked to military applications uh, in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, studies were made, for instance, on the effects of the atmosphere on radio communications or on the possibility of using the sun's light and guidance systems for missiles. And it was the Cold War that gave a fillip to the US space effort, leading to studies on the design and use of artificial satellites and missile technology. But now, as far as the Indian space program, uh, for instance, the Indian space program was concerned, the thrust from the very beginning was peaceful and focused on development day, developmental aims. You know? So this was a complete departure from what was going on in the world. Um, the list, you know, I, much has been written about the goals of the space program. There's a very, uh, very nice book by SK Das called Ch Touching Lives and how the program actually kind of affected lives um, on the, you know, the grassroots level. Uh, the list of potential applications that Vikram Sarabhai had in mind, even in 1970, as far back as then, uh, you know, included the fields of agriculture, forestry, oceanography, geology, mineral prospecting, and cartography. And I want to quote Sarabhai's explanation just in, in, in for one, um, one aspect, uh, one area, long-range weather forecasting, just to provide a flavor of his thinking, because this was, he did not, the space program was, was imbued with a lot of lot of uh, emotion and a lot of, um, it, it was not just a technological program. Uh, it was a program that was, you know, that, that uh, he had put in thought, reflection. And, and, uh, and so I just want to kind of provide a flavor of his, of his thinking. The sun provides the driving force for almost everything that happens on earth, weather, rivers, vegetation, fossil fuels, and of course, life itself. But in contrast to the apparent constancy of the sun and the complete dependability of sunrise and sunset, we experience a capriciously variable environment. The fury of hurricanes and lashing ocean waves, droughts and floods, starvation one year and bumper crops another, and uncertain radio communications. The natural scientist looking for the subtle links through which the sun affects the earth and our lives has at last acquired the exploration in the exploration of space, a dramatic new capability for study. I just think that the way he talks about this is almost a sort of very evocative way he's talking about, um, about uh, what he foresees, how he foresees, uh, you know, how he sees space entering people's lives. And I, I, I was struck, you know, how, how often, for instance, people talk when they talk about Sarabhan, all the people I interviewed use the word love. It was always love. Sarabhai fell in love with science. Uh, he embraces, uh, you know, whether it's people or um, new areas of study or new ideas, uh, there's a kind of great exuberance, but also a great emotion. Um, even um, Kalam, uh, when he talks about, um, talks about something as dry as a space uh, manifesto, you know, there was a, a point at which uh, Sarabhai wrote this sort of program, a, a 10 year plan. And he says, you know, it showed a man who was in love with his country's space program. It's kind of a very odd and almost, I'd say, feminine um, concept. Uh, but I think that it, it, it gives you an insight into Sarabhai's, the kind of passion that he brought to his work. But here, too, Sarabhai was very, very concerned about the possibility of the program. I mean, when I talk about uh, the space program being uh, being for developmental purposes. This was, this was a very, very kind of um, a concerted effort. This was not something taken at all lightly. Sarabhai was very, very serious about keeping the, keeping the kind of program, um, the, the intent of the program, the goals of the program uh, to be developmental. And he said, for instance, uh, again and again, and here is one quote, there is a real danger that developing nations may adopt a space program largely for this glamour, devoting resources not through a recognition of the values of which we are talking about here, but from a desire to create a sham image nationally and internationally. So here he's expressing this, this kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it a fear, but a concern that, uh, because I think that he was conscious that what, what we were doing was that it was an extremely sophisticated program that people would have said that why was a poor country like India, uh, you know, developing a space program, that it was an indulgence, that it was a luxury. And he was very, very clear that that was not how he saw it. In fact, he, he says again, 
Yeah, in India, the immediate goals of our space research are modest. We do not expect to send a man to the moon or put elephants white, pink, or black into orbit around the Earth. I mean, this jag, of course, you know, you know anything about the, the times. And, you know, that was clearly aimed at the two superpowers, the US and the USSR, who were at that point vying like, you know, eager school children to outdo each other in the space for race. In January 1961, the US had sent a chimpanzee called Ham into space atop a redstone rocket. In April, the Soviet Union pronounced, you know, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space. So clearly the kind of reference to elephants and, you know, man on the moon, et cetera, is in response uh, to, to the space race and the Cold War. So at the heart of all of Vikram Sarabhai's diverse activities, and, you know, as you can see, he operated in the realm of a kind of, you could say, a sophisticated um, area, whether it was uh, technology or, you know, involving international collaborations. Uh, he was, for instance, a visiting professor at MIT. We used to go every year for research. Um, you know, he, he was involved in, uh, in starting an institute in dance, in design, management, etc. You would think that these are all fairly um, of a, a certain level uh, of sophistication. But I think that at the heart of it was something, he was very, very grounded and very, he never lost sight, never. I mean, it was always the motivation which drove everything he did. And so when, when you talk about all these diverse activities of his, they were united. Um, they were united, one by his, uh, his, um, his, uh, his framework as a scientist that his approach of being a scientist and, and science being his, his, uh, his kind of uh, introduction to the world. Uh, and this particular, this particular idea uh, of, of development and upliftment. And I think this is not something that I've come across, but uh, to me, it, it kind of reminds me always of this sort of Gandhian dictum, you know, which says that whenever one is in doubt, and I just pull it up, Whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man whom you may have seen and ask yourself, if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him, will he gain anything by it? Will it restore him to a control over his own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to Swarat for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? And I think this is, this is the key to understanding Sarabhai's vision. That this was, and again, as I said, this is, this, is not, not, this is not something I've come across. I don't know. I mean, he was very much influenced by Gandhi. He, um, has, he mentions it in his, uh, in his interviews, you know, how he, he, he was, uh, for instance, he, he spent the evening, um, you know, the, the night before Gandhi set off on the Dandi March, for instance, Vikram Sarabhai and his family went to the Sabarmati Ashram and they were there, there the whole evening. And uh, he has a very clear memory he, he describes in this interview where he um, heard, you know, he said there were very moving bhajan sound that evening. He also recalls talking to Gandhi, and he says he was very struck by how seriously he took a conversation, even with a young boy that I was. And so Gandhi was, of course, you know, a, a very influential figure. But as I said, I have to say that this is a sort of speculative leap that I'm making when I connect this particular dictum with how he, um, how he approached um, everything he did. And you know, if you look at this quote, I mean, there are many, many parts of it. So one is that you, you look at the face of the poorest and the weakest, and you ask if the step you're contemplating is going to be of any use to him. And I think, in a sense, whatever Sarabhai was saying constantly was that it has to be upliftment, it has to be development, it has to be for the, the most marginalized and the most, um, the ones who have the least access to resources. And when you, when again, in this quote, you say, will he gain anything by it? Uh, will it restore him to control over his own life and destiny? And I want to come back to the satellite instruct, the, the, the experiment that I talked about earlier, uh, using satellite technology, uh, very sophisticated sat satellite technology to use, uh, to sort of reach the poorest villages in the country. There too, it was like, his idea was to use technology to spread opportunity to, to those who were the least, um, you know, who were the poorest, who were the most marginalized, who had the least access. Um, again, when you see here, it says, will it lead to Swaraj for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Again, it's not just hungry, 
but they're also spiritually starving. And again, I want to kind of go back to what I talked about, for instance, architecture. Um, Sarah is sitting with Khan trying to design something beautiful. I mean, Khan was, of course, designing it, but uh, Sarah Bhai participates in this process. Uh, his involvement with design, for instance, he is very much someone who is thinking about aesthetics. Uh, so spiritual, spirituality, I mean, he was not only thinking about um, hunger as in physical hunger, but he was also thinking about uh, spiritual upliftment, aesthetic upliftment. Um, you know, this is again something uh, when I want to, you know, um, in, in the influences I talked about, when Sarabai was a young man, for instance, when he was studying at IISC, uh, he would have been in his early 20s, and he used to uh, often go, go uh, uh, across to, there was a, 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 apparently some sort of religious, uh, a spiritual institution close to where he lived, and he would often go off and have conversations, apparently, with the, the person who was running that place. Um, another time I've, I've seen a kind of reference by Mrinalini uh, as to how he and Kasturbhai Lalbhai would, for instance, go off into long philosophical discussions. Um, you know, she said I would be kind of left alone while these guys would be talking about uh, spiritual matters and things like that. I just want to say that basically Sarabhai was a multifaceted individual. And I guess in this talk, I've sort of tried to, you know, you can't help but um, see these various aspects but they were integrated. Uh, I mean, he was a fun loving person. And at the same time, he was a deeply serious person. So sometimes when he talks about things, he approaches everything very seriously. So for instance, when he starts a dance school with his wife, who was a classical dancer, it's not just a dance school. He is thinking about, for instance, and there's a very long quote, which I have not included here, but which he gave uh, in, a in a radio interview, where he talked about the, where he talked about bringing a certain aesthetic, uh, bringing a certain idea of, um, you know, very serious study of classical, uh, study of classical dance, if that could be implanted, like transplanted to the West, uh, in the sense of starting a school in Ahmedabad, uh, where, that, where that culture is not, not where, where that exposure to that culture has not been there so far, then he's, he almost saw that you can have a generation of young people who, who are in, you know, in whom this is inculcated, this idea of classical beauty, or classical dance. And this is a, you know, as I pointed out, Ahmedabad or uh, Gujarat is a more entrepreneurial, a more trading kind of community, a more mercantile community. And so he was always thinking, he, he was always thinking about change and transformation and um, in, in ways that, you know, of, of bringing one thing to another, forming linkages, but even while he was doing these sort of very serious kind of, he was an extremely fun loving person who always never missed a chance to kind of have fun. And this is something that I just sort of, uh, one of the things that I, um, I, I was told about was that when he used to go to Bark, um, uh, you know, when he used to go for his meetings to the ARC, he would insist on taking the boat and would love, you know, the kind of, just because he loved the water kind of splashing and uh, that, little, that little bit of zest, um, that he could enjoy in, in a time when, um, you know, uh, his life, his schedule was so busy uh, that, that there was no time, there was sort of, but he took, he snatched kind of pleasures wherever he could. He also loved music. He was uh, um, fervently kind of interested in classical music, classical dance. Um, and that's another thing, just talking about his schedule reminded me. That's another thing I want to talk about, that we are increasingly uh, in a, at a time when we are told that the wealthy must be philanthropic, they must contribute, they must do charity. And, you know, it's, it's kind of to me very interesting that Sarabhai was, came from an extremely wealthy family. He could have just given money, um, you know, the, he could have made contributions and that could have been, but he did not, he gave off himself. He threw himself into, um, into the kind of fray almost in a sense. And his, his struggle for a viewpoint that he thought was right, uh, for, a, for a kind of uh, technological, because none of these things were easy. I am just sort of reeling off the fact that he started all these institutions, but he faced difficulties at every step. Uh, people would not, very often people would not uh, kind of, you know, he had to fight for his, for a new way of thinking. He had to fight uh, against people who belong to an old, and had another set way of thinking. He had to fight with bureaucrats who 
for their own good reasons, perhaps believe that, you know, maybe funds had to not be given for, or, you know, uh, needed to kind of control things. He had to fight all the time, but uh, he was willing to do it. And in that sense, how I see him, uh, and again, I'm going back to the child that I was, and I again want to bring up this point about how different people can connect to him. Um, that as, a, as someone who was sort of ch a child coming from certainly not the kind of wealth or any kind of wealth that he would have come from, one could still see a correspondence, a way forward, a way of thinking, a way of doing um, that, that I think was very, very inspirational and uh, also offers, I think in a world right now when everything is a binary, where we are not sure what modernity is, where we see modernity in terms of hardware and uh, technology, uh, maybe, uh, you know, a kind of urban gloss, uh, that we need to kind of think more deeply, think about what, think about integration. I mean, I think that's what he did. He integrated, he integrated, you know, different fields, he integrated different ways of thinking. It, it was not a binary, uh, it was never a binary way for him. It was always a, a more complex way where he looked at all the possibilities and tried to forge something new. And I think that's what, what makes him so innovative and so current and relevant right now. Um, so I just want to check, am I out of time? time? Um, Hello? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. I was going to read out something, but I'll stop here. No, that's fine, ma'am. Maybe another five minutes. Yes, okay. I just, you know, wanted to just because this is such a big part of, of him, I just thought that I would quickly just read out a small description from my book of the first sounding rocket launch just to bring space into the reckoning again. So, on 21st November 1963, India was ready to stage its very first blast off. Many weighty names in science and technology had gathered for the occasion. Lamont was there, as were his assistants, Mary Lise Chanin and Michel Autier from France, and observers from Brazil and Argentina. Arnold Trutkin, Robert Duffy, Ed Bissell, and others were there from NASA. The Indian contingent included Bhava, an eminent scientist, Dr. A.P. Mitra, then with the NPL, and Dr. P.R. Pisharati, founder director of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, UNA. The governor of Kerala was there, along with the district collector and the bishop. The world was watching. The setting was one of stark beauty. The gentle waves sparkled under the sun while the trees reached darkly into a breathtakingly azure sky. And yet for the Indians, massed about the bronze sands, the moment was shot through with tension. So much had already gone wrong. The night Apache rocket supplied by NASA had been flown to Delhi by US military air transport, but the truck that was bringing it down to Cochin had broken down along the way leaving its precious cargo stranded in the middle of nowhere. Once that wrinkle had been ironed out, it was discovered that the French payload, which was to be released in the atmosphere, could not be fitted into the American rocket. Ratilal Panchal, PRL's expert mechanic, had to be flown down from Ahmedabad. Prafur Bhavsar and Kalam supervised him as he scraped it by hand. Camera assistants had been trained to photograph the cloud that would be released by the rockets from four vantage points in Kanyakumari, Palayam Kotai, Kodai Canal and Kotayam. But there was the possibility that the phone lines would fail, making communication impossible, and the sky could turn dark and make the images fuzzy. In the circumstances, it was not surprising that when the moment arrived, when the rocket rolled out on a truck to the launch pad, the sultry air was thick with tension. And almost immediately, things went awry. As the rocket was being hoisted onto the launcher, the hydraulic system of the crane developed a leak. Technicians moved in to shift the rocket manually. The rocket was in position, but then the remote system to raise the launcher to the correct angle malfunctioned. The team conferred and sent a man to operate the controls on the launcher itself. That having been done, everything seemed at last in order. An alarm sounded to clear the area around the launch pad. Vikram's team members prayed and held their breath. Just then, Pramod Kale, at the time a new student at PRL, noticed a worker still fiddling with the launcher controls. With a shout, he dashed out and dragged him away. At 6.25 p.m., the rocket streaked away into the gathering dusk. Minutes later, a sodium vapor cloud emerged high above, tinged orange by the setting sun. R.D. John recalls the moment. 
We were all there in the oval canteen. We were jumping with joy. Baba too. Vikram sent home a telegram. Gee whiz, wonderful rocket shot. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very, very nice way to end your colloquium. Uh, very nice of you to read that uh, passage and I think uh, excellent. It was very nice, very nicely written. And also it really brought the, uh, the <laughs> of uh, the colloquium. Thank you very much. And uh, quite a few of my colleagues and I'm sure uh, even Alec uh, just joined minutes uh, after you started your talk and he's there on the audience. Um, so uh, I now request uh, the uh, people to ask questions. So you can you can just unmute yourself and ask the questions, please, who are there on Zoom. May I? Yes. Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, my name is Alak Ray. Um, I uh, enjoyed your talk a great deal. Um, I have actually more than one question, but I don't know whether I'll be allowed. Um, uh, you have referred to his um, uh, multiple responsibilities. And you know, one of the, uh, the two of the key responsibilities that he had uh, in the 1960s um, was um, after Baba's death, um, the ch charge of atomic energy. Uh, and at the same time, he was also spearheading the uh, space program. Mm -hmm. And from what I hear from my uh, more senior colleagues within the atomic energy, this, was, this space program was not really necessarily um, uh, looked upon as something very solid or very, uh, very uh, um, something to bank on. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the younger people who, who joined uh, from the DAE into uh, the space program, they were adv advised by the seniors that, okay, you are going into a risky territory and the program is not well established, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, even even at fairly high um, uh, administrative levels uh, among the scientists, not 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 the administrators, there was some degree of skepticism about mm -hmm. space program and um, within the atomic energy department. So how how do you think that he had navigated these uh, these barriers? And you know he is actually involved in so many different things and. How is it that he could still uh, clearly uh, navigate this and bring uh, success to both the programs? Um, so there is, you know, his management style was such that it's very hard for me to, um, you know, it, it doesn't sound very convincing if I was to just put it in a line because he, there was a way he worked in which he was able to, he did work, uh, I, I'd say, unrealistic hours. I mean, he worked around the clock. He slept very little. And I think that there was certainly an element of, of um, you, you know, I mean, uh, not recognizing perhaps human limits on, uh, on required rest and so on. But he did have a way of working um, where he would acquaint himself with the fundamentals very thoroughly. And then he, he would... He would, um, he would, you know, I, I mean, even for instance, Raja Ramanna, when he first met Sarabhai, which was just when I think he hadn't yet officially taken over, but they had an initial meeting. And he said, I was very impressed how quickly he had kind of um, got, got to, you know, understand um, fundamental kind of issues uh, and details of the program. So, um, so he, and he did that repeatedly. He did that with every new undertaking of his. Uh, mind you, when he took up the atomic energy uh, position, then he had to give up his uh, responsibilities to the family companies. And so he had to actually divest some of his responsibilities. And the institutes, he would start and then he would leave. He, he would not stay on. So he would found, he founded IIM, et cetera. He didn't, he wasn't stay, he, he, he left me, I mean, pretty soon after, you know, he laid the groundwork and move on. So it wasn't like he was still involved in them. Uh, but that, did, that, did that actually create problems for the programs themselves? 
Not at all. I mean, I think that that was one of its trends. If you see the I mean, CIM today, it's, you know, uh, the kind of, uh, you see Atira, you see AMA, all these institutes that he founded at that time. He did, he, I think that his fundamentals, he, he started very strong. He, he invested himself at the beginning very thoroughly. He had many meetings, conceptual meetings. Uh, so, so the kind of groundwork, the foundation was very strong. And then he let go, he could do that. I mean, that, that was one of, again, his strengths uh, that he didn't need to, you know, he didn't need to be there to control things. He kind of put the structure in place and he could trust. He was able to, uh, you know, kind of allow subordinates to kind of grow. And uh, so, I mean, I, I would say, no, I, I, I think in fact, that was a strength that he left. He didn't cling on to any of these. Uh, but now coming to the atomic energy and space, there are two kinds of things one has to keep in mind here. I think that his way of functioning, certainly you are right in saying that, you know, space program was at that point seen as something not very, um, it was not very solid. Uh, it was just starting off. It was an innovative program. I mean, I'm sure you are familiar, you've seen pictures of, you know, conditions at Thumba, everything was in the wild. Uh, there was no, I mean, you know, they were working out of a, an old church, uh, 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 there, was, there was nothing, the pigeons uh, flying around and the birds in the rafters, there was nothing there. And it, so it was all very kind of chaotic and, and necessarily so is what uh, writers on space like Gopal Raj, for instance, say that that was the only way an innovative program could have taken off. Uh, you know, I think that by the time Satish Dhawan came uh, after Sarabhai and then others, um, his or successors as well, they laid out structures and you know put it because by that time it had expanded and grown and it was possible then to I guess take the next step. Uh, but what I do want to kind of I think that there was a great deal of skepticism in the atomic energy program regarding Sarabhai and the space program, and I I would put some of it down to just a different sort of personality of the program itself uh, of the two programs. Um, and I think Saraba himself, when he came into the atomic energy program, was not, I mean, you know, the space program, his, poly, his sort of, his students, his star, they loved him. I mean, he was a much beloved figure. I think when he came into the uh, atomic energy program, it was not, uh, there was a degree of skepticism. There was um, not that great outburst of warmth. And I think that was because, you know, I guess Saraba founded the space program and it was imbued and infused with his, personality. I suppose maybe that Baba had perhaps some of that devotion in the atomic energy program. So I would put some of that to just a difference in kind of perception and personality. Some part of it to, you're absolutely right, the space program was just starting off, you know, like uh, who knew where it would go um, and what would come of it. So certainly it was not, at that point, the future was unknown. Okay. Thank you. I will ask my other questions after my other colleagues ask. Okay. Sure. Uh, are there any other questions, please? Anyone? Okay. So maybe Alak, you can ask your second question as well. By that time, maybe others. Yeah. yeah. So you have shown beautiful photographs of um, uh, Sarabhai's family, including mm -hmm. one photograph of Mrinalini Sarabhai. Yes. Um, and Mrinalini's uh, Darpana Academy had actually come to TIFR uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s. Uh -huh, I see. Before, I think. Mm -hmm. And we were not quite ready for it, quite prepared for it, but we were completely uh, delighted and very surprised when we came to know that Mrinalini herself would come and perform at the uh -huh. Omi Baba Auditorium, which she did. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, you know, when after the performance, she had uh, come to uh, the Institute uh, proper and, uh, you know, we were having reception uh, at a faculty lounge, it seemed to me that she is very familiar with the institute, uh, the geography, and 
mm-hmm. all the all these uh, aspects of it, mm-hmm. which she indeed was, because you know this was her their their association um, mm-hmm. with the Baba um, and his institute uh, has been very very long. Mm-hmm. Um, would you discuss a little bit about the relationship between the two families? Um, you know the Sarabhai family itself and Baba and his his clan. Um, because, you know, there is a great deal of misinformation which is going around, and unfortunately, yeah. because of um, very um, <laughs> poorly made um, certain uh, information channels. So, yeah. I mean, I think it's important to have these uh, things clarified so people could shed some light on it. You know, I mean, I... I... I, you know, I, Baba and uh, Sarabhai, it was kind of interesting. Sometimes what happens is when you're doing research, uh, particularly, I mean, you know, Vikram Sarabhai is a known figure, uh, but there was nothing, there was that kind of in-depth research, which can, you know, link, bring the links together and kind of make sense of uh, a life had not actually been done. And uh, and similarly with Baba, I think that, uh, you know, I think modern India, we still, there's so many gaps in our knowledge. And so we're still kind of, uh, but the point I'm making is that when one does this research, sometimes you come to know, you see a pattern that you are not, you, you might have known in bits, but you didn't really see. And I, I found that the Baba Sarabhai pattern, I'm calling it a pattern and I'll explain um, it kind of it, it kind of suddenly emerged while I was suddenly looking at all my material. And what happened was this that you know I, I kept um, I kept I would tell people that I'm writing a book about Sarabhai and and they would tell me oh yeah he died in a plane crash uh, or someone would tell me uh, an anecdote about Baba or about Sarabhai and then someone else would tell me the same anecdote about Baba. So I thought that was kind of interesting that it was they were so intermixed in the public mind, uh, you know, that they people mixed them up. People thought one was the other and the other because both, I guess, had died young. Uh, and as I kind of discovered, as I said, you know, these patterns emerge when you're actually looking at your material. So, for instance, uh, they were together at IIC, and I didn't uh, think of the social aspect of it till someone, um, till this scientist I was talking to. He was, uh, I think, he was a Tamilian. And he said, you know, they were so unusual. And I said, oh, really? I mean, I, I didn't think of them as being unusual. And he says, yes, because scientists usually come from the West or the East, uh, so, uh, the east or, the, or the South. Uh, and uh, I mean, and these, you know, were unusual from the West. And then they were so different. I mean, they were, they had money. You know, they used to go off in the evening to the West End uh, Hotel and they would meet uh, friends, you know, social, including, you know, young um, women, there was a sort of, there were working professional women, there was an architect from Sri Lanka, for instance, and her sister, there were, you know, it was a kind of more, um, a kind of way of enjoyment that let's say the, the average um, student uh, at a science institute would not, this would not be the norm at all. And, uh, but so these two young men, you know, were, I mean, they, 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 there was a certain style that they could afford, a certain way of life they could afford, and they could also a, a certain way of life that they were at ease with. So I'd say that they were certainly friends. And as I said, this idea of the fact that they might have plotted when they were so young, because, you know, there's a kind of synergy in which they start the, 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 the two programs, uh, the nuclear energy program, and then space comes after that. Uh, and um, it's done, you know, under the kind of umbrella of the DAE. So, um, so you wonder, you know, did they, did they talk about this? So did they, were they continually, you know, were they, of course they would have continued to be meeting and talking. So uh, that's one thing, but I cannot say that there was, I did not come across actual evidence of uh, a great daily socializing or uh, nothing like that. I mean, uh, so there's no evidence for it that I have come across. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying that that's certainly not anything that I came across. Um, no evidence of, I mean, families meeting. or I mean, of course, it is true that Rinalini did know um, Baba because they were in Bangalore at the same time. As I said, they were young people of a certain uh, similar age all around 
at the same time uh, of a similar sort of background. But um, no, there's nothing that I can, I can say I have come across to show that they were meeting regularly and had some, any kind of family interaction. Thank you. Okay. So any other, any other questions, please? Okay, so if not, uh, let us once again uh, thank Amitasha for a very, very interesting talk, brought about lots of, lots of new information, but more importantly, also like what uh, Alak was trying to kind of get some things clarified of mm. the recent, uh, uh, let us say, forms of uh, movies or films, whatever, and what it has brought out. And I think it was very nice that we heard from rather very authentic uh, kind of so. So meanwhile, I also, okay. So these are basically clapping. Yeah. Uh, so thanks once again, very much <laughs> for a very, very nice talk. And uh, we hope to hear from you again in future on another equally interesting topic. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of the and all of us here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.